Members, that concludes portfolio questions. The next item of business is a debate on housing. On motion 7613 in the name of Adam Tompkins, and I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Adam Tompkins to speak to and move the motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Scotland faces a housing crisis on a scale not seen since the Second World War. We urgently need to talk about this and to act. Housing, alongside health and education, should be right at the top of the Scottish political agenda. And to help put it there is the reason why Ruth Davidson gave a keynote speech on housing at the IPPR last month, and why the Scottish Conservatives are using our parliamentary time this afternoon to debate housing. Presiding officer, opposition debates in this chamber can serve different purposes. And our purpose today is not to seek to give the government a bloody nose, to inflict upon it another parliamentary defeat, which it can then proceed to ignore, but to start a national debate, which, I hope, politicians in all parties will want to engage in. We have got to act to solve Scotland's housing crisis. And if the government won't use its time to lead debate on how we do this, presiding officer, we will. When policymakers talk about the housing shortage, they tend to talk in numbers. We know, for example, that fewer than 10,000 Sorry, we know, for example, that 10,000 fewer homes are being built each year compared with pre-recession levels. We know that over a five-year period between 2007 and 12, the number of new homes built by the private sector dropped by a staggering 54%. We know that there are up to 150,000 families in Scotland on local authority waiting lists. And we know, based on an analysis by Audit Scotland, that it could be more than 20 years before there, are, before there are enough new homes to meet the projected increase in households in Scotland. 20 years, presiding officer. These statistics paint a stark picture of the crisis before us and the immense challenges that lie ahead. It's little wonder that the governor of the Bank of England has emphasized that problems with housing are the biggest risk to the UK economy, or that the CBI has warned of a perfect storm brewing in the housing market. But what often gets overlooked is the human cost of this crisis. A house, after all, isn't just four walls and a roof. It's where memories are made and where families are formed. It's part of a wider community. For many, it's the very essence of aspiration. And our belief on these benches is as fervent as it ever has been, that everyone should have the chance to own their own home. In her recent report, in her recent report, let me make a little progress and I'll make, make, make way. In her recent report on the life chances of young people in Scotland, Naomi Eisenstadt observed that setting up home is one of the major challenges of successful young adulthood. For nearly all of us, she said, a sense of home, of community, and of a network of family, friends, and colleagues all help define our lives, she wrote. And this, presiding officer, is what good housing policy is really all about. Young people, however, are having to defer their futures because they can't afford to get on the housing ladder. The charity Shelter has said that almost a quarter of 18 to 40-year-olds across the UK are delaying starting a family because of a lack of affordable housing, some by up to six years. Relationship choices are also being constrained and ties to communities are being severed. I, I, I'll give away to Elaine Smith. Elaine Smith. I thank the member for giving way. I do hope that the member isn't implying that the only house worth having is a bought house and that actually there is a very good place for public rented housing in our housing debate. Adam Tompkins. Well, of, of, of course, which is, which is why we think that half of the houses that should be built in Scotland are affordable housing. But look, I'm not going to make any apology for a policy that enabled half a million Scots to own their own home. Relationship choices, presiding officer, are also being constrained and ties to, community, uh, to, to communities are being severed with half of renters believing that they will not be able to afford a home in their local area in their lifetime. And that's not to mention the difficulties of saving enough for a decent deposit. So these are the issues that we face, presiding officer, and there is no mystery as to what is driving them. The same issues come up in any review or evidence session. The availability of land at reasonable prices, the lack of infrastructure or delays in delivering it, planning system delays and conditions, disconnect between agencies, nimbyism, and housing not being seen as a priority by government. And this is the background against which we should view the housing shortage. 
but the SNP's response to this crisis has been poor. In 2007, a full decade ago, Nicola Sturgeon conceded that far too many people in Scotland were unable to satisfy what she called the basic aspiration of home ownership. But in the intervening years, the SNP's commitment to build 35,000 new homes a year has dwindled to less than half of that. Homes for Scotland have argued that the single most effective way to address concerns about housing need and affordability is to increase the supply of new homes. Indeed, in order to make our country a better place in which to live, work and invest, it is essential, they say, that Scotland has enough homes at the, of the right types in the right locations to meet the diverse housing needs and aspirations of its growing population. The SNP's manifesto pledged to build at least 50,000 new affordable homes over the course of this parliament. But the latest statistics show that last year only 7,300 such homes were built. And at this rate, only 36,000, not 50,000, homes will be completed by the end of this parliament. And the SNP's target will not be achieved until well into 2023. Now, the Scottish Government cannot shoulder the blame entirely for this crisis. The economic downturn had its part to play. But it is the Scottish Government's responsibility to create the right conditions for improving housing outcomes. And we haven't seen anything like the leadership on this issue that we need. Perhaps it is unsurprising then, perhaps it is unsurprising then that RICS, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, have questioned the adequacy of the policy systems in place to address the housing crisis in Scotland. As they pointed out in 2014, patterns of housing needs and demands are changing, but policy responses are failing to adapt at the necessary pace. So here, presiding officer, is what we would do to change that. Presently, housing sits alongside local government as a ministerial portfolio under the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities. But if we really do want housing to be recognised as one of the key priorities of government, we believe that it should be elevated to a cabinet secretary position, thereby increasing levels of coordination and accountability. Presiding officer, apart from the availability of land, the lack of appropriate infrastructure is the biggest barrier for house builders and also one of the primary concerns for existing residents, both in terms of road capacity and public services. Key development decisions are increasingly caught in the congestion of a labyrinthine planning system. Government statistics suggest that it takes 64 weeks for a major development to get planning permission in Scotland. The Scottish Government's own 2016 review of the planning system called for, and I quote, a national infrastructure agency or working group with statutory powers to be established, involving all infrastructure providers as well as planning representatives. But the Scottish Government's subsequent consultation on the future of the Scottish planning system has not acted on this recommendation and indeed appears to have rejected it. I will. Mike Rumbles, so far, so far in his contribution, he hasn't mentioned social housing. And a genuine question, I'm asking, is, is that deliberate or by design or is that by ac accident? Do you want to see more social housing as well as private housing? Adam Tompkins. That, perhaps Mr Rumbles wasn't paying attention, but I was asked the same question earlier on and I've already answered it. And the answer is, of, yes, of course, we, of course we do. Our view is clear, presiding officer. Scotland needs a new housing and infrastructure agency to lead on the medium and long-term infrastructure development that our economy needs, placing housing at the centre of its considerations. Homes for Scotland agree. They were damning of the Scottish Government's recent consultation on planning reform, reflecting what they called their great disappointment and frustration at Ministers' refusal to confront the main planning barriers to delivery. And we can only hope that Mr Stewart has been listening as he prepares his long-awaited planning bill. Among other matters, the new agency would herald a new relationship between the Scottish Government and local authorities when it comes to housing and infrastructure. Our motion calls for a new deal on housing. One option for delivering this would be a whole series of housing deals. The first generation of city and growth deals is still being negotiated and rolled out across Scotland, but already we should be thinking hard about a second generation of bespoke deals, including on finance, tailored specifically to the housing needs of Scotland's cities, towns and rural communities. Give way to Ash Denham. Ash Denham. I, I thank the member for taking that intervention. 
Um, I wonder if you would comment on this. Since the Tories took office at Westminster, levels of house building in England are at the lowest level since Baldwin was Prime Minister in 1923. Why is it that Tory action and rhetoric in this area does not match up? Here. Adam Tompkins. Why is it that the Scottish National Party wants to talk about English history and the Scottish Conservatives want to talk about housing policy for Scotland now and in the future? Like the first generation presiding officer of city and growth deals, housing deals need to be focused on regions, allowing clusters of local authorities to work together to bid for the package of support that they think best fits their need. This is already happening in England, that Ash Denham so much wants to talk about, notably in the corridor between Oxford and Cambridge, and it needs to be happening here in Scotland too. If delays in putting infrastructure in place are one of the main barriers to development, the new Housing and Infrastructure Agency could also take the lead in designing innovative funding mechanisms to unlock this, such as developer infrastructure loans. And such loans need not be confined to road and transport infrastructure. Digital infrastructure, as well as necessary public services, such as primary schools, GP practices, and health clinics, could also fall within the agency's remit. Finally, presiding officer, let me turn to new towns and garden villages. Ricks proposed reviving the concept of new towns in its 2014 report. They said this, we encourage the Scottish Government to endorse effective provision in growing areas by enabling the delivery of six to eight major new communities. These could be formed as new towns, strategic regeneration within existing towns, or as, exten or, or as extensions to current locations of growth, to which we say, let's get on with it. Again, this is already happening elsewhere in the UK, and it needs to happen here too. A new wave of garden cities and towns is being supported by the UK government from Northamptonshire to Oxfordshire to Essex, with quality design, cutting edge technology, creating local job opportunities, accessible green space, and a high quality public realm. These are, I've given, I've given away three times already, these are ambitious, locally led proposals, supported by central government, creating new communities that work as self-sustaining places, not merely as dormitory suburbs. Presiding officer, new cabinet position, new government agency, new housing deals and new towns. Just some of the ideas that we are seeking to bring to the table. We need to talk about housing and we need to act. The housing shortage it's not a looming crisis or a distant threat. We're already living in it, and we need political leadership to tackle it. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I want to encourage uh, both the giving and taking and receiving of interventions. I would just uh, uh, praise Mr Tompkins for taking three interventions and keeping within his time. I would encourage all members to do similarly. I call Kevin Stewart to speak to and move Amendment 7613.2 in the name of Angela Constance. Or oh, the Cabinet Secretary is going to move the motion in her name. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, President Officer. It's somewhat ironic that on the day that the Tories choose housing as the topic for their debate, that the National Audit Office has pointed to Tory welfare cuts as being the main driver behind a significant rise in homelessness. Yeah. Citing the benefit cap and local housing allowance as examples, the National Audit Office criticised the UK government for failing to evaluate the impact of their benefit changes on homelessness. So will Ruth Davidson's new towns be suitable for all those families who have faced the brunt of harsh and yeah. punitive yeah. welfare cuts? Because we all know that good quality, warm and affordable homes are absolutely vital to securing economic growth, supporting and creating jobs and ensuring a Scotland that is fair for this and future generations. So we are determined to increase and accelerate housing supply across all Ten years, And that is why this government, through times of austerity imposed by the UK government, has invested over £4 billion to deliver over 69,000 affordable homes. We not only ended the right to buy, preventing the sale of up to 15,500 houses over a 10-year period, but reintroduced council house building, the first such central government support, and to do so in a generation. And we have built social housing, in a moment, we have built social housing at a faster rate than any other uh, part of the UK. And we have supported more than 23,000 households 
to buy a home over the last 10 years, with nearly three quarters of whom are 35 years or under who have benefited. Now, give me, Mr Tompkins. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. In her report this year, The Life Chances of Young People, Naomi Eisenstadt, who supports the Government's um, closure of right to buy policies, said this. One result of right to buy was that it did allow people on lower incomes to access owner occupation and thus build up housing wealth. Now right to buy is no longer able to provide that function. Government must do more to help low income households build up housing wealth. Unquote. What is the Government's response to that? Well, the government's response, as I said, Mr uh, Tompkins, has been to uh, increase and accelerate housing supply across all tenures. That's why our Help to Buy schemes um, have supported uh, young people into home ownership. And, you know, we've already gave a commitment uh, to implement the work of Naomi uh, Eisenstadt because she makes very valid points about the life chances uh, of young people. But you have to recognise the results of the toxic Tory legacy of removing half a million houses yeah. in Scotland for social rent. Yeah. What has that done? What has that done to the life chances and the prospects of young people struggling today to get on the housing ladder or to be able to get a, a, a home that they can afford to rent? Maybe later, if you were so committed to this debate, you would have been in Mr Tompkins' shoes today as opposed oh. to sitting on the back benches. Design officer. Design officer, last week, last week the First Minister set out in our programme for government how we will continue to improve access to high quality, energy efficient, affordable homes. Our More Homes Scotland approach supports the increase in the supply of homes across all tenures. This means that we work closely across the housing sector to promote the construction of new homes, supporting jobs in construction industry and inclusive growth in the wider economy. And this work includes a wide-ranging review of the planning system to improve the effectiveness of planning processes. And we are investing over £3 billion in affordable housing to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes over the lifetime of this Parliament. That's a 76% increase on our previous uh, five-year investment. So this Cabinet Secretary for Communities is far more interested in spending time and money on building houses rather than building a new national infrastructure agency. And it's also important to recognise that 35,000 of the 50,000 homes target will be for social rent. And we never hear the Tories talking about targets for social rent. And our 35,000 target for social rent is a 75% increase on our previous social rented target. And this will ensure an average between 12 and 14,000 full-time equivalent jobs in construction and related sectors. And crucially, our More Homes Scotland strategy provides certainty to Scotland's councils and housing associations. This year, for the first time, we've committed to a year-on-year -year increase in funding to be shared by councils over the next three years to continue that momentum. And this equates to 1.75 billion allocated across Scotland. And last year saw a level of activity in affordable house building sector that has not been seen since the early 1980s, with over 10,000 affordable homes approved, an increase of nearly 30% on the year before. Our approach is to increase the number of completions and starts and approvals on a year-on-year -year basis by investing now and giving housing associations and councils and other partners the confidence and the assurance that they need to invest, as opposed to a rather Janet and John simple uh, approach of determining that targets have to be broken down uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. We have to increase the supply of housing year-on-year. And yesterday, the latest affordable housing supply statistics showed that our pace is maintaining as affordable housing continues to be approved at a higher rate than the previous year. So, you know, I'm conscious that time is short. In focusing on housing, we must also look at what is being done to help those who do not have a place to call home. In 2012, we introduced World Leading Homelessness Target, which is a nation we can all, of course, be proud of. But last week, we announced the creation of a short life expert group uh, to lead change in this area uh, with a new £10 million a year ending homelessness together fund uh, to support the recommendations of that short life and working group. And Mr Stewart will say more about this, uh, about how we'll redouble our efforts um, next week. 
It has, of course, been suggested that new towns uh, are the solution to uh, all of our needs. Uh, as someone who represents new towns, uh, I'm a big fan of new towns and the new town of Livingston in particular. But it is important to recognise that it's not for governments to impose new towns on communities, but to provide them with the framework uh, to allow communities to put uh, the right developments uh, in the right place. And of course, planning drove forward uh, the new towns and planning has helped uh, to enable the delivery uh, of many more sustainable communities before then uh, and since. And as part of our More Home strategy, a major programme of pl planning reform is ongoing and we will introduce the planning uh, reform bill uh, at the end uh, of uh, this year. And of course, the reform of planning is absolutely crucial to ensure uh, that we get better synergy uh, between planning, development uh, and uh, infrastructure investment. And one example of that would be the £9 million of support uh, that we announced for Highland Council as part of the Inverness and Highland City uh, region deal. This established the Highland Infrastructure Loan Fund to support and accelerate uh, the delivery of affordable housing uh, across the region because we are committed to homes across all of Scotland and that has to include uh, rural uh, Scotland. I'm sure Mr Stewart in his closing remarks will uh, say more uh, about energy efficiency uh, and our plans in and around uh, the Warm Homes Bill. But just to conclude, presiding officer, uh, as a government, uh, we are always open to debate and there is indeed no monopoly of wisdom. But we won't be taking any lectures this afternoon or at any other time on housing from the Conservatives because the Tories will be hoping that we all have short memories. Well, I can assure them that we don't have short memories. We have not forgotten their toxic legacy of removing housing benefit from young people. Current, that's not history, Mr Tompkins. Your government very recently removed housing benefit from Council young people Jim. under the age of 21. How that improves their life chances, it God only knows. And it was your government and your party to that Council defended Council, the bedroom tax that has an impact on 70,000 Scottish homes. It is your government that has introduced universal Gabriel credit, Secretary, which sees a delays in payments resulting um, in, in rent arrears. And it was your party uh, that sold off half a million uh, Scottish homes. Presiding officer, all of that before we even begin to see the impact of Brexit. Uh, and as Cabinet Secretary, please. I will indeed finish my remarks there, presiding officer. I move the motion in my name, and I won't be uh, supporting the Conservative motion tonight. Thank you. And I, would, I can see this might be a heated debate. I would encourage all members to refrain from overly personal attacks. I call Polly McNeill to speak to and move the motion in her name. Presiding officer, if we do all agree that living in a warm and affordable home is a basic right, and I hope we do, then we are a long way from this being a reality. The social housing sector is shrinking. That is a fact. It was 32% in 1999, and it is now... 23%. We are not building homes fast enough to grow this sector. Generation rent has become an adopted phrase as the private sector housing trebles in size. Rents are rising and there are huge barriers to home ownership. But that is only part of the story. Because the greater story about housing is not just about a housing shortage as we've been hearing from the Tory benches uh, this, uh, this afternoon. It's important, I think, to realise that the increasing issue of housing is a signifier of divisions in society, of deepening inequality across the United Kingdom between the haves and the have-nots. That is the real housing story that is the challenge for this Parliament. We are in the middle of a housing crisis with a severe shortage of affordable housing. Wages have flatlined over the last decade and there's no sign of that changing. Rough sleeping appears to be on the rise and a shocking number of people, I'm sure we all condemn, have died on our streets only last year. The rollout of universal credit has added to the crisis, fueling rent arrears and social landlords are genuinely worried about the impact of this. So I agree with Adam Tompkins when he calls for a national debate, but it can't simply be about ideas about new towns, and I hope we'll get to discuss that. And there is indeed a lot in the Tory motion that we can agree with. We do agree that 
the Housing Minister should be at the heart of the Scottish Cabinet. But we cannot support the Tory analysis of the housing problem while they continue to deny the impact of universal credit rollout and continue to support the austerity agenda. There is also much in the government position that we can agree with, and we will work where we agree with them, such as the commitment to mitigate housing benefit for under-21s. But we believe that they should be far more ambitious on house building targets and be more specific on the types of housing and where they should be built. Yesterday's statistics say a lot of different things. Yes, affordable housing looks as if it's going up by 3%, but it is in no way going to meet the challenge of the housing crisis. We are proud of Labour's own record in government, our commitment to the principle of community-based housing, our far-reaching action on homelessness seen as Europe's uh, most radical legislation, and our investment in Glasgow's housing stock. It was on a scale likely not to be seen for some time to come. We are pleased, in fact, that are pleased to the Minister and to the third sector to include the stock transfer authorities in the waiting figures because it's important to recognise that that means there's a greater number of people waiting on a house. We agree that there is a, short, a chronic shortage of housing supply and it is the biggest challenge. So to that extent, we agree with the main motion. According to Shelter, over half a million people struggle with bad housing and homelessness. We need a step change. We need to be imaginative too about thinking how to put this together to ensure that we do not waste another parliamentary term without making serious pro progress. It is for that reason that we believe that it's social house building that should be the national project and that it should follow on the scale of the Queensbury crossing now that that has been successfully completed and should be Scotland's major infrastructure project to allow for local delivery plans across every council. This would identify the capacity, land available and the resources able to deliver homes for social rent. But importantly, to identify the skills that we need to build houses and to ensure that we don't lose them because our big projects have been completed. Figures this week show that there's been a 6% drop in social housing completions compared to last year. So we must increase the pace. The Institute for Fiscal Studies said that in the relation to wealth distribution across the generations has been driven by a reduction in home ownership amongst young adults. I think that uh, Adam T Tonkins and Angela Constant talked about. But the biggest barriers to that are stagnating wages and large deposits. The average deposit for a first time buyer in Scotland is a staggering 21 and a half thousand and it's important I think to note that first-time buyers make up virtually half of all house purchases financed by a mortgage so for many people it is out of reach worrying statistics yesterday on the completion of houses in the private sector were down nine percent on the previous year so more must be done to remove the blockages in the system. I'm sure others will talk about this this afternoon in the planning system and the infrastructure system to make sure that that does not continue. Because if it does, Minister, I suspect there is no way that you will reach the 50,000 target that you've set for this parliament. Encouraging and supporting home ownership, home ownership is vital to ensure choice and fairness, affordable home ownership and the extension of the help to buy is an essential part of that support. I would like ministers this afternoon to clarify whether the Help to Buy scheme will be extended towards 2019 and indeed whether there will be any reform of this scheme to ensure that those on the lowest incomes get the most help. It is important for developers to know this because when they are planning their house building for 2019 and beyond, it has been an extremely important scheme for them. In conclusion, presiding officer, we believe that the Scottish Government must up their ambitions on housing and house building if we have to reach the challenges that Scotland faces. We will work with the Government and in fact we will work with the ideas of all political parties. Some of the ideas, uh, for example, the building of new towns, and I declare an interest too that uh, although I was born in Glasgow, I was brought up in Cumbernauld. Um, I believe there were five built in the 1960s, but the Population Centre for Health said it did have a detrimental effect 
on Glasgow and other um, cities uh, where they took uh, the professional classes in those new towns. I certainly would not like to see Please these conclude. towns built on that basis. On that basis, presiding officer, uh, thank you. And could you move the amendment, please? I move the amendment. Thank you. I call on Andy Whiteman to speak to move amendment 7613.4. That will is set a big upon 7613.3. Six minutes or thereabout, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I want to thank the Conservatives for bringing this debate on housing to Parliament today. I think much of the debate already has and may continue to be highly political uh, in nature. Um, I, for example, could join others in criticising the Tories for their decades in power and their presiding over at least one housing bubble uh, and crash, or for their role in, in welfare cuts and the impact that's having, particularly on young people. Or I could cite Labour's record in government, uh, Gordon Brown in his first budget in 1997, promising that he would not let house prices get out of control. Uh, but when he left office a decade later, they'd tripled. Or I could cite Nicola Sturgeon and the targets she set a decade ago, which have not been uh, realised. So let me say at the outset that my constituents, particularly the generation of young people being frozen out of affordable housing, are looking for ideas and practical solutions. These exist in the realms of planning and housing policy. Books and academic papers have been written about them. I've invited academics and architects into Parliament to talk about them. Reviews such as the Land Reform Review Group recommended a number of them. And we had a few in our manifesto last year. So at risk to my own political career, I want to congratulate Ruth Davidson for her recent speech. We don't agree with some of the ideas in it or some of the assumptions that lie behind it, which we do want to explore further. Ruth Davidson highlighted a number of issues in her speech, many of which, in fact, are Scottish Green Party policy. She was right, for example, to draw attention to the scale of private renting not through the choice of the tenants, but through lack of, lack of real choice in the housing market. She was right to draw attention to swathes of existing housing falling into serious disrepair. She was right to note we need to take on vested interests. And she was right to advocate direct government intervention to procure land. And she's right, above all, to admit that the big question is the question of land, and that we should be considering repealing legislation that ended the ability of local authorities to acquire land at existing use value. So I and my party commit to continuing the conversations that we've been having with her MSPs and with MSPs from other parties to use the next four years to design and enact a far better system of housing and planning than the broken system we have now. Presiding officer, the current housing system is broken. We need a new approach to new build, to building maintenance, to accelerating accelerating energy efficiency, to creating more nuanced use classes for domestic property, for example, to tackle the scourge of short-term lets, to reform housing taxation, and to tackle homelessness. Happy to take an intervention. Elaine Smith. Thank you, Mr Whiteman, for taking the intervention, but I wonder, like the other intervention that I made earlier, he doesn't seem to have mentioned affordable public rented housing. Is that part of the Green approach? Andy Whiteman. It is indeed, and I'll be saying something about that in a minute. Greens advocate the following measures, for example. We advocate a target to eliminate the speculative volume house building industry within 10 years. Unlike the Tories, we think this model is redundant. It's time for a new model, one which reflects well established practices in much of Europe, including, as Ruth Davidson noted, in Germany and the Netherlands. And this new model will be based on public-led development with high-quality community-based planning, putting consumers in control of procurement, including housing associations, restoring the professional role of planners and architects, and boost the skills, opportunities, and talents of the SME building sector. We advocate a new approach to land acquisition, based on restoring the right for local authorities to acquire land at existing use value. We advocate a new approach to housing taxation by abolishing the council tax, a tax described by the Scottish Government's own economic adviser, Sir James Mirrlees, as indefensibly regressive. We also support the abolition of land and buildings transaction tax, another tax which Sir James Mirrlees argues there's no sound case for retaining. We want to see a radically different approach to housing care, repair and refurbishment, with logbooks, sinking funds and mandatory energy efficiency measures at point of sale in the private sector. 
because over 80% of Scotland's existing homes will still be in use in 2050, and only with serious action to improve the quality and energy efficiency of existing homes can we ensure that everyone in Scotland has a comfortable, warm and affordable home to live in. Above all, reflecting uh, Elaine Smith's point, we advocate a substantially expanded programme of genuinely affordable housing using cooperatives, councils, housing associations and others to provide genuine affordable homes to all who wish them, not simply those meeting defined income criteria. Now, along with most other parties here, we are committed to end the stigma of homelessness. But past solutions are clearly not working, and the work of the Local Government Communities Committee in its forthcoming inquiry and uh, the, the indications in the programme of government reassure me that that stance uh, is agreed. Particularly, schemes such as Housing First we are very encouraged by and believe should be extended to support, support, to support services to individuals who face a, very vari a variety of very challenging circumstances in their personal lives. Presiding officer, we are in a strange position where the previous Housing Minister, Margaret Burgess, stated in January 2016 that the government expected the private housing market to operate whenever it, wherever it can without government intervention. Whilst just over a week ago, the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party was arguing for direct government intervention to procure land. As it happens, I see some signs that this government is sympathetic to this as well. But if, the case, if this is the case, it needs to be much, much more explicit and demonstrate a greater urgency in coming forward with ideas. As I indicated in my opening remarks, we stand ready to work with all parties in the chamber to pursue radical new measures through planning, land acquisition, fiscal and other policies to deliver a very different housing future for the people of Scotland. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr White. Now I now call Alec Cole-Hamilton to speak to move Amendment 7613.1. Six minutes, please, Mr Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking the Conservative Party for raising this important issue, because we are without question in the grip of a national housing crisis. The financial crash of 2008 hit house builders, those looking to own their own homes and families seeking to rent affordable properties across the board. And since that time, year on year, the total number of newly built houses have averaged out at 18,000. Before the crash, it was 24,000. That's a remarkable 6,000 fewer properties each year, despite rising demand. Balance that reality against the fact that on any given day in Scotland, around 170,000 people are on local authority housing lists. And all too often, it is the most vulnerable of our citizens who bear the brunt of this dismal statistic. Indeed, official statistics published in January showed that a 17% year-on-year rise in the number of children living in temporary accommodation. That's nearly 6,000, an increase of 826 on the year before. And these numbers have been rising for some time. That challenge visits with each of us as local representatives in our constituency surgeries every week in the shape of families desperate to move out of substandard temporary accommodation and into a stable tenancy, often facing multiple barriers and disadvantages, and each one deserving in one way or another to be considered for special treatment, and yet each sadly competing against one another and sometimes hundreds of others for the smattering of new homes that appear on the housing portal every Friday morning. This in many ways is a crisis of our own creation through decades of housing policy, through seemingly, though seemingly well-intentioned at the time, that has now come to reap a dreadful whirlwind. Policies such as the right to buy and the fundamental disconnect between the manifesto commitments to build uh, homes for social rent and those actually delivered. For example, in May 2011, the SNP manifesto promised 30,000 homes for social rent. A mere six months later, that target was revised down to just 20,000, with the rest being private homes for sale. Now, increasing the stock in so-called affordable homes is desirable, but only if you can manage to scrimp together the deposit to make that matter. As the Tories in this debate so far have seemed to conflate the issue of socially rented homes with affordable houses to buy. But the business end of this crisis is in the lack of a homes available for social rent. I will give way to Andy, Andy Whiteman. <clears throat> I thank the member for giving way. Does the member agree with me that the very definition of this curious word affordable needs to change. Many afford so-called affordable homes are not affordable to a lot of people that I know. Alec Colham. 
I thank, I thank uh, Mr Whiteman for the intervention. I absolutely agree with him. I'm actually coming to that point later in my speech. What's important in our triangulation around this issue is that we, transfer, we answer the needs of those adrift of the housing market first by recognising the yawning gulf in terms of demand for socially rented housing and its availability. Recognising too that young people in particular may be facing a perfect storm in terms of low economic activity, prohibitive private rental markets and an inability to access housing benefit. While those who are in work and seeking to start a family may not hope to own a home for a considerable time longer than their parents had to wait. This chamber is invested with the powers to answer much of this challenge. We lack only the political will with which to do so, but today's debate is a start. I, I talk about needing political will because if I may say so, presiding officer, we're talking about a fundamental redesign in our approach to housing yeah, yeah. and its development yeah, in this yeah. country. At present, my constituency of Edinburgh Weston is a microcosm for all that is wrong in terms of planning and housing growth. While huge tracts of brownfield sites lie fallow in more industrial areas of the city, the picturesque green belt surrounding areas like Camo, South Scotston, is eyed for development, not because of the fantastic roads infrastructure or the capacity of its schools or its doctor surgeries, all of which are woeful, um, and uh, all of which are woefully inadequate, but because developers know that they can expect to charge the highest property prices in the country for their output. And this is where I address Mr. Whiteman's point, such as the ambient house price in these communities, affordable stock provision within these new developments is still crushingly out of reach for even the most well-heeled of first-time buyers. And all too often, developers like AMA, who built the Brighouse Park development in my constituency, will pull out of commitments to planning gain, like in their promise to build a pavilion and sports fields on the old Cramon campus only to leave it as meadow and wasteland. Another example of developers throwing up houses but leaving no element whatsoever of community in their wake. Presiding officer, we need to start thinking in this place like place makers, recognising the housing shortage but never losing sight of the community shortage. The outlook is also deteriorating in the teeth of Brexit. Economists know that inflation and job insecurity is only going to get worse as we leave the EU, but skilled house builders are already leaving this country, and the exodus will continue throughout the Brexit process. Who will build our homes when they are gone? Bold and radical action is vital to tackling the housing crisis because successive Scottish and UK governments have been aware that they were under underbuilding but not doing anything about it. Shelter Scotland, as we have heard, say we need 60,000 homes by the end of this past. Yet this government's target is a full 10,000 homes adrift of that. We need to lift our ambitions to at least answer the call of those experts in this field. As we grow new settlements in Scotland, in each of these ventures, we need to ensure that we are building communities with health services, schools, transport infrastructure and in place before residents start to take occupancy. And I will conclude here, presiding officer. If we get the affordability right, we can build a society where young people at the margins and professionals alike can either rent or buy a home that the stability that that affords because adequate housing is the key to social, social mobility and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry I'm having to be strict but uh, we have no time in hand now so in the open debate it's a tight six minutes for all speakers. I call Maurice Golden to be followed by Ash Denham. Mr Golden please. Uh, thank you presiding officer. Let me begin by saying that I agree with the first minister when she declared that part of creating a fairer and more prosperous society involves everyone having a safe, warm and affordable home. This should be applauded and it is an ambition that my party will give full backing. We will also seek to hold the Scottish Government to account when they fail to achieve targets or indeed when they fail to put in the correct mechanisms in order to deliver our common goals. Let's look at the SNP's record. Under the SNP, new homes being built have plummeted 40%. Scotland has been forced to make do with less than half the 35,000 new homes a year that were promised by the SNP in 2007. Moreover, home ownership, which is one way to boost low-income households, has fallen too. The SNP's target to eradicate fuel poverty by last year has also been missed and can be added to this catalogue of failures. Setting these failures aside, 
there is a num another number that needs to be highlighted. And it points to perhaps the biggest housing challenge we face. And that is that more than 80% of existing homes will still be in use in 2050. Put another way, although not the only solution, improving the current energy efficient, in, inefficient housing stock will have a huge impact on fuel poverty and climate change. Yes, on that point. Minister. But Mr Golden makes good point about um, homes being in existence for a long period of time. Uh, would he agree with me that it's a bit daft that there is no VAT on new build homes, but there is VAT uh, on actually dealing with the problems that currently exist in homes that are currently there? Would he support me and others in this chamber calling on the UK government to remove VAT altogether from home repairs to have a level playing field and to invest in existing houses? Uh, Mr Golden, I'll give you an extra 30 seconds. That was a long intervention. Uh, it certainly was. I would certainly happily support the Minister in increasing the number of new homes started, which has fallen by 40% since 2006, or I'd certainly support the Minister in increasing the number of new homes completed, which has fallen by a third uh, since 2006, and I'd also support the Minister in increasing home ownership, which has also fallen by almost 4% as well. Another uh, catalogue of failures which have to be added, not to mention the 150,000 on the waiting list for a new home, to be added to your copybook, Minister. So, the Warm Homes Bill, it must affect real change by bringing properties across Scotland up to a higher level of energy efficiency. Doing so would be a win for all those struggling to keep warm. It's a win for our NHS with fewer health problems related to cold homes and it's a win for the planet with reduced carbon emissions. Uh, I'd like to make some progress. That sort of transformative change is exactly where the Scottish Conservatives are approaching. We want every property where possible upgraded to at least an EPC band C by the end of the decade next decade, WWF Scotland have said that this would help 1.5 million households deal with cold homes and dozens of organisations from the existing Homes Alliance to Bernardo's to Friends of the Earth want to see action on energy efficiency. So where is the commitment from the SNP? It certainly isn't to be found in funding of energy efficiency measures, which has stagnated since 2015. We need to take the challenges in home energy efficiency seriously, and that's why the Scottish Conservatives want to increase the capital budget allocated to energy efficiency measures. Shelter Scotland estimates that almost a million Scottish households are living in fuel poverty. Yes. Alec Cole-Hamilton. I'm grateful for Mr Gordon for taking the intervention. I hear him talk a lot about fuel poverty in this debate. And I wonder how Mr Gordon felt when Theresa May revealed in her manifesto before this NAP general election her plans to cut uh, cold weather payments and means test them. Mr Gordon. Well, to qu quote from the existing Homes and Al Alliance, fuel poverty is a complex problem with multiple drivers, including issues covered by both devolved and reserved powers. However, in this parliament, in this environment, energy efficiency of homes is fully within the competence of the Scottish Government, and hence the reason why my speech is focused on that area. The environmental impact of energy inefficient housing is uh, very serious. Heating accounts for a large percentage of Scotland's energy demand, yet renewables accounted for less than 6% of non-electric heating demand in 2015. It isn't good enough and the SNP must do more if they are to meet their target of 11% by 2020 and I'd like to help them on this. We need to increase heat pumps for individual domestic properties as well as uh, uh, increased di district heating for industrial and larger scale developments. This will require the correct financial package, regulatory environment, as well as consumer campaign in order to deliver the ideal market intervention to meet and surpass the target. This SNP uh, government must start to take this seriously and join us and the many others who understand the benefits of making Scottish homes more energy efficient. We must bring up 
every home to a minimum EPC band C, maximise solar energy capture, do more to uh, make people aware of the benefits of smart meters, and for the sake of the environment, of our economy, and most of all our fellow Scots, it's time we recognised that warm words won't heat our homes. Thank you. I call Ash Denham to follow by Monica Lennon. Ms Denham, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, my grandmother lived in a rented two-room flat in a tenement in a big city when my mother was young. By the time my mother was 14, they moved out to a brand new council flat in a brand new town, giving her and the rest of the family an indoor bathroom for the very first time. A month after I was born, my grand got the keys to our brand new council house. She loved that house and lived there till she died about 40 years later and it was then made ready for the next council tenant to make it their home. That house, that home, represented to her and millions like her, security and stability. And that is the effect of policy being made into reality. But it wasn't to last. And indeed, as Thatcher's right to buy policy spread throughout the country, stories like my grandmother's became less and less common. In 1979, 42% of the UK population lived in council housing, but by 2014, it had plummeted to just 8%. Failure to replace the council housing meant that the stock of homes was decimated. So when Ruth Davidson and the Scottish Tories come to this parliament to say they have ambitions to build more affordable homes or to build a new generation of new towns, it's very difficult to take them seriously. How can anyone take seriously a party that says one thing and consistently does another? In her speech to IPPR earlier this month, Davidson said, the lack of housing supply in Scotland is one of the biggest challenges of our time. But what she failed to acknowledge is that challenge was largely born out of our own party's right to buy policy, which diminished the availability of affordable housing. She also said property ownership in this country is akin to an oligarchy in the hands of a minority rather than the masses. But what she didn't mention is that about a third of formal council homes sold off in the 1980s are now under the control of private landlords, yeah. reaping wealth from what mm -hmm. could be a decent home Absolutely. for someone who needs it. Ruth Davidson called for a new housing agency to support development to streamline planning and ensure public services are on a par with that increased housing. Yet the irony of the leader of the Scottish Tories calling for more services while simultaneously supporting tax cuts for the rich yep. is lost on no one. It's easy to demand services when you never clarify how you will pay for them. What's worse than that? is that in all the supposedly fresh ideas that Ruth Davidson made in her speech on housing, there was only a passing reference to homelessness. Yep. I but I guess this is not surprising mm -hmm. when it is the Conservative Party's woeful austerity policies that have pushed more people into poverty and escalated levels of homelessness yep. across the UK. Like many areas of public service, the SNP government has taken bold action on housing to mitigate the destructive effects of barbarous Tory policy emanating from Westminster. The Tories' bedroom tax policy would have negatively impacted 70,000 Scottish households, 80% of which have a disabled adult. A University of Newcastle study linked this policy to higher levels of hunger, poor diet, anxiety, and also depression. Since, 19, since 2014, we have provided funding to ensure no one in Scotland pays the bedroom tax, and we will abolish it completely at the first possible opportunity. The SNP also ended the right to buy policy in Scotland, safeguarding the future availability of valuable social housing. On top of that, the SNP government exceeded its five-year target of delivering 30,000 affordable homes and exceeded its target of 5,000 council homes between 2011 and 2015. More than £1.75 billion has been allocated to local councils for affordable housing development, 
So to put that into perspective, in Edinburgh this year, that represents £30 million in investment. And by the end of this Parliament, we will make good on our promise of delivering a total of 50,000 affordable homes. I will. Jamie Green. Thank you. I thank the member for taking intervention. Uh, in, in the last Parliament, which I was admittedly not a member of, the SNP only delivered 70% of the social rented housing that it promised at the beginning of the session. Why? Ash Denham. Just today, the NAO report has been published, which blames Tory policy for driving up homelessness. I, th I think it speaks to saying one thing and then the action regarded to deliver it. It also said that Tory ministers are slow to understand that link. I think the members on the benches here seem to be a bit slow in understanding the link as well. And they have no strategic approach. Conservative credibility on this issue is in absolute tatters. Presiding officer, this year's programme for government announced further action on housing to bring vacant properties back into use, strengthen and simplify the planning process, and a dedicated 10 million a year um, for the Ending Homelessness Together Fund. And all this action from the SNP comes as the UK Tory government's budget for social housing has taken cut after cut after cut. The Conservatives are very fond of their Orwellian rhetoric, but in housing as in elsewhere, sensible policy matched with appropriate funding and then appropriate action is what will work and is what is working in today's Scotland. No, you must conclude. You must, that conclu the must conclude. Must conclude. Conclude means conclude. Please sit down. Please. But their I'm sorry, when I say conclude, I mean conclude. Please sit down. Call Monica Lennon to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is important that we have this debate on housing today, so I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak and to support Polly McNeill's amendment to the motion from Adam Tompkins. Good quality housing is central to physical wellbeing and mental health, so ensuring that everyone has a safe, warm home to live in is key to improving general wellbeing and creating a stronger economy. Frankly, solving Scotland's housing crisis should be higher up the political agenda. But I have to say, when I hear from the Tories about new cabinet positions, new towns, new deals, new agencies, I fear we are hearing from the same old Tories because there's no recognition about what it takes to be able to afford to get into a home in the first place and to stain a roof over your head. Because Adam Tompkins mentioned uh, the report by uh, Naomi Eisenstadt on her review of the life chances of young people. And he, he cherry-picked from that report but he said nothing about her findings on low pay and insecure work and the impact that that has. So perhaps we'll hear more from that on that in, in conclusion. And I say housing crisis because that's exactly what we do have in Scotland today. The rising cost of housing is pushing more and more people into poverty. The private rented sector is continuing to grow, with rents rising faster than inflation and resulting in a growing housing benefit bill for the government, which goes straight to private landlords. And around one in four households who rent privately are families with children. The current cost of a house rose by 75% between 2003 and 2013. And only a quarter of people under the age of 34 own their own home and that's down from just under half in 1999. It is unfair that this generation of young people will not be able to access something that previous generations took for granted, including many of us. To tackle this housing crisis, we require a range of targeted approaches, and I think we've heard some good ideas, you know, including from some of the, the Tory benches, um, some of their analysis is correct, and I think the thinking that Andy Whiteman has been has been doing and leading on is, is, is good work that we can look at and build on. We do need to invest and build in social housing for a new generation. As someone who grew up in a council house, I'm only too aware of the unfairness that another generation of young people are growing up without that option or have been forced to wait for years and years and years on housing lists which are impossibly long. We also need to help ensure that help to buy policies help everyone and I think Polly McNeill touched on that because we have a system where those on the lowest incomes remain locked out of home ownership. 
The target for 50,000 affordable homes over this parliamentary term is welcome, including 35,000 homes for social housing. But targets can only be met if greater support is given to the construction industry and the supply chain involved in the construction of homes. I worked as a, a project manager for a, a major house builder in 2008 when the recession hit. So like many others, I was made redundant and we've seen many people, many skilled people leave the sector. We know that in Scotland we need 12,000 new construction workers between now and 2021 and we need to do much more to make that happen. Adam Tompkins didn't take my intervention when he was in full flow about the planning system, but I wanted to, to raise is that if we uh, are serious about investing in social housing and delivering that, that has to be backed up by a well-resourced and a reformed planning system that puts communities at its very heart. And um, this ambitious programme for delivering new towns and new deals, I was interested to, to find out what um, the Conservatives are proposing to do to support the planning workforce, which has diminished by, by 20% in, in recent years. Because when the planning bill comes before Parliament later this year, it does provide a unique opportunity to be bold and be radical about how we reshape the planning system. So that communities feel that, that they have a voice rather than being um, dictated to, as it sometimes appears. And I hope the government will take the opportunity to engage with the planning democracy movement as the bill progresses throughout the Parliament. I've made clear before in my disappointment that so far it appears the government isn't that keen on a rights-based planning model, which would give communities a, a real say in decisions that are being made about the places where they live. Um, and I think and Alex Cole Hamilton is not in his seat right now, but he talked about um, placemaking, and I think that's the approach that we have to, to, to get involved in. So I would welcome a change in direction from the Scottish Government on this. In their briefing for today's debate, Homes for Scotland have also expressed concern over the lack of detail in the planning review proposals following the Places, planning, uh, places People in Planning position statement in July, especially in relation to local development plan gate checks and the introduction of an infrastructure levy. For a long-term house building strategy to work, we need to invest in the planning workforce and we need to facilitate that. There has been a real um, loss in skills and I think a loss in confidence in a sector which has become very reactive. Just about to conclude dear presiding officer, um, I think something that I just want to mention is that there's a huge amount of land that's already zoned for planning or has planning permission already. So it's not simply about you know, increasing the size of land banks. I think we have to have a real honest audit about where uh, housing consents lie. Are they in the right place? Is that the kind of, you know, we can reinvent the wheel and, and build new towns, but I think we really have to get an understanding of what's already been consented and does that fit the needs of communities? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I call James Dornan to be followed by Miles Briggs. Mr Dornan, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. One of the things I admire about the Tories is their pure brass neck. Uh, you know, Miles Briggs comes up, talks about the NHS, just refuses to talk about the NHS south of the border, doesn't mention the humanitarian crisis that the British Red Cross described or the junior doctor strike. And remember, this is the place where you're in control, where you have to, your words have to be turned into actions. We get Murdo talking about the economy, refusing to talk about Brexit and the impact that's going to have, 80,000 jobs and reduce GDP by 5%. Uh, and sorry, Murdo Fraser, because I don't want to be accused of being rude. My apologies, Murdo. And, <laughs> and now today, and now today, we have Adam Tompkins. <laughs> and Adam Tompkins knows very well that I'm very fond of him. But for him to get up here and talk about housing as if this is a major issue for the Tory party is laughable. I mean, the next thing we'll be getting our education spokesperson getting up proposing free school milk and our economy spokesperson saying that there should be jobs for the miners. This is just rewriting history. Ensuring everyone has a safe, warm and affordable home is 
and has been for many years a real priority for the Scottish Government. And it's why we've invested over £3 billion in affordable housing to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes over the lifetime of this Parliament. And I just want to touch on what Maurice Golden was making a big play of about targets that the Scottish Government had to change and, and the Scottish Government didn't achieve. He seems to have missed out, it's again, it probably takes me back to my early comments, he seems to have missed out something very important that happened around about 2007, 2008. A big financial crash, you might not remember it, and yet you should because you were knee deep in it. But, uh, and obviously everything had to be re-looked after that financial crash. Our budget was cut, the, 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 the uh, money that we've got to spend in housing was not available. Obviously things had to change then, but we've reached our target since, and we've been increasing. And if, if you look at what's happening down south and compare it to here, if we had gone by the level of house building down south, we would have 40,000 houses less than we've built in that period of time over the last 10 years. And that, I hate to say this with George here, would mean that there was a town the size of Paisley missing from the Scottish population. Good thing, bad thing, you tell me, I don't know. But, <laughs> presiding officer, we can be proud of our record in terms of housing. I want to go on to the right to buy scheme. It's been touched on earlier on. What, somebody, what, what hasn't been mentioned yet was, when that right to buy scheme was brought in, and it was brought in purely for political reasons, it was not brought in to help people to buy houses to make their lives better. It was brought in to, so, because she, she thought that if people bought their houses, they would turn into Tories. And that's what it was all about. And, what, and I'll tell you how you can tell that. Because local authorities were barred from reinvesting that money in housing. And if they were serious about housing, that's exactly what they'd have done with that money. <laughs> Certainly, Angus MacDonald. Angus MacDonald, please. Thank you. Does the member agree that encouraging local authority pension funds to invest in social and affordable housing, as has already happened, it was the Falkirk Pension Fund, of which I was a, a governor, I, I should declare, it ticks so many boxes uh, and also provides pension funds with an eth ethical investment and a decent return? James Dornan. I, I, I think that's a great idea and I, I would hope that the uh, Strathclyde uh, Pension Investment Fund uh, that represents uh, the workers in my city would, would consider that. But, but we talk about also the, the right to buy meant a loss of houses for uh, council tenants. Ash very eloquently put forward her case about her, her grandma. Please could you use full names? I know you're trying, but please. I don't think I'm that trying, presiding officer, but yes, I will do. Ash, Ash then I'm ready. Right. Uh, I never got, we never got a council house until I was 16. We stayed in a room and kitchen with an outside toilet. When we got our council house, it had three bedrooms, it had an inside bathroom, an uh, inside toilet. It was just heaven. Thatcher came along and said to people, we'll give you that house for next to nothing. There you go, big bargain. Eventually, because buying the house was cheaper than renting the house, my parents bought that house. They did it with great regret, but they couldn't afford not to do it. What they didn't read was the small print that meant that people were going to have to pay huge bills that they never had to pay before. That they weren't aware of, of the knock-on effects because the same clothes that they moved into in 1969, a close for many of you is a tenement that's got lots of different built, uh, houses in it, has now got two private landlords, but not two private landlords that, uh, in the top flats. They two... So, uh, have, have both went bankrupt, their businesses went bankrupt, they too are lying empty. The, the, it now means that that close is not the close that it was when, they bought, when my parents bought that house and over the 30 years that they stayed in it. So that's the that's downside of what you've done. You never did this. I'm not taking you seriously for one instant about why you're doing this. You're doing this because Ruth Davidson has had bad press all summer. And what she thought was, let's see if we can get something to deflect attention and show that we are the good Tories and not the supporters of the rape clause and the UDP uh, uh, deal in, in Westminster and Brexit. And that's what this is all about. This is the not members about in his closing this moments. Is not, this is not about helping the people of Scotland. This is about trying to help the Scottish Conservative Party and its flailing leader. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Dornan.
I call Miles Briggs, who followed by Joan McAlpine. Mr Briggs, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I welcome the opportunity to take part in today's debate. And I'm really pleased that um, the Scottish Conservatives are using our first business slot allocated in this new parliamentary year to debate the issue of housing, an issue of such importance and concern to individuals and families across Scotland, including in my own fast-growing Lothian region. And I think what we've seen today is some parties are wanting to engage positively in that. I very much welcome Andy Whiteman's uh, contribution to this, some of the members like we've just heard may be less so. And I want to focus my remarks today on the impact of health, poor, damp and cold housing has and how we need to ensure that our existing housing stock and new housing are not creating additional health inequalities. Housing can have a number of direct and indirect effects on both physical and mental health and is a significant driver of health inequalities. Health Scotland 2016 Housing and Health Inequalities Report sets out the challenges faced in tackling health inequalities around housing. The Scottish Public Health Network's report from earlier this year, Foundations for Wellbeing, Reconnecting Public Health and Housing, is another welcome contribution to the debate on the connection between housing and poor health. Poorly insulated homes that are difficult to heat push people into fuel poverty. Cold houses and flats impact disproportionately on elderly, disabled and infirm people. The stress of struggling to heat your home can create and exacerbate mental health conditions. Almost a fifth of households state that their housing keeps them warm in winter only sometimes. The latest Scottish, Scottish Housing Conditions Survey indicates only 37% of houses were in the Energy Performance Certificate Band C or better. 5% of homes in Scotland remain within the lowest two energy efficiency bands, F and G. And whilst we welcome the Scottish Government's intent around the Warm Homes Bill, we're clear that it does not go far enough, and we will continue to push for a commitment in this Parliament to upgrade the energy efficiency of all properties to EPC C rating or above by the end of the next decade. This would, of course, reduce carbon emissions as well as household heating bills. It is a real concern that so many Scots are living in cold and damp homes, given the effect that this has on many conditions, notably respiratory illnesses. Yes. Marie Todd. Wait, would, would the member agree with me? Um, I represent a rural uh, constituency, as you know, in the far north of Scotland. Would the member agree with me that one thing that might help the people living in my constituency who pay more for their electricity than the rest of the country would be another look at the market prices for electricity that we pay? Miles Briggs. Um, I thank the uh, member for that intervention. I think, um, I know she's been raising this issue at Health Committee as well, we need to look at innovative, innovative ways of actually reducing bills. And I know in the Highlands, um, just this week, she's brought projects to Parliament to highlight that. And I think that's something which actually, as a party, we want to see this Parliament actually debating, getting away from just attacking each other and looking at the issues which will make a real difference to people's lives. Some... Some studies suggest those living in damp homes may be as much as 40... You should maybe listen to this. Some studies have suggested that those living in damp homes can be as much as 40% more likely to suffer from asthma compared to those living in better accommodation, while those living in dark, poorly ventilated homes are 27% more likely to report poor health conditions, including asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. In its submission to the Health Committee's recent inquiry into preventative agenda, the British Young Lung Foundation Scotland identified damp housing as a key challenge and noted the growing body of evidence highlighting the negative impact of mould and fungus from damp homes on lung health, as well as the complementary research showing that dry homes can improve people's lung health. The costs to our NHS of dealing with the consequences of respiratory and other conditions caused or made worse by damp, poorly ventilated housing are significant. So investment in improving our housing stock must be an important element of the future preventative agenda. Overcrowding is also another issue to which we must give rapid attention. Around 3% of households in Scotland, some 70,000 people, are thought to be living in overcrowded accommodation. This can have a real negative impact on mental health, in particular, it's also a factor in the poorer educational outcomes among children living in overcrowded accommodation. The proposals we have set out on increasing the number of new homes being built in Scotland with a new National Housing and Infrastructure Agency and a Cabinet Secretary for Housing and Infrastructure to drive forward the delivery of housing would make a real difference. I won't have time, sorry. Refurbishing the 34,000 empty homes in Scotland as part of a help to rebuild programme should also be made a priority and I hope that's something 
um, the front bench of the government are actually listening to and looking at. To conclude, presiding officer, I again welcome today's debate and I call on the Scottish Government to ensure the health issues which we have, I have raised today are actually embedded in housing policy as we go forward. As the Scottish Public Health Network has said, we owe it to those whose so-called home is a risk to their health to strive harder to address these problems and to maximise the housing contribution to health of the people of Scotland. And I support the motion in the name of my colleague, Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Mr Briggs. I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Elaine Smith. Ms McAlpine. Thank you, presiding officer. Effrontery, arrogance, nerve, audacity, downright cheek. All these describe the Tories' motion on housing today, but I'm with James Dornan. I think pure brass neck is a better description. The Tories demand additional spending every day in this parliament. They never say how it will be paid for. They demand tax cuts in the same breath. And they ignore the effect of their party's austerity, which has resulted in this parliament's budget being cut by 9.2% in real terms over 10 years of Tory government. And now they come here with completely uncosted proposals for a new house in Quango. I'm sure that'll be a vote winner. Yes, I will give way, yeah. Marjo Fraser. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. I think she might want to reflect upon the statistics she has just quoted in terms of this Parliament's budget. If she reads her own government's budget documents very carefully, she will see that in real terms, this Parliament's budget in the year we are currently in is higher than it has been at any point in the past. Will she withdraw her untrue statement? Joan McAlpine. No, I, I certainly won't. And uh, in fact, I would refer him to I would refer him to the Fraser I would refer him to the Fraser of Allender Institute, which has said that over the next four years, uh, the the government's uh, funding will fall by six percent. So the quote that I was giving was over ten years. You can you can use my quote. You can use the Fraser of Allender Institute, which confirms drastic cuts to this Parliament's budget. Uh, as for the new towns, uh, we haven't been given any detail of where these new towns will be built, uh, how, how much they're going to cost. We don't know which rich Tory landowners are going to benefit. Perhaps one of the lairds on the Tory back benches could spare Ruth Davidson's blushes by donating some of their expansive acres for this strange project. The Tories' timing is terrible. They come to this chamber, as others, as others have said, talking about a housing crisis on the very day that the National Audit Office says that homelessness in the UK is likely to have been uh, very much driven by the government's welfare reforms, in particular the freeze on housing benefit. We've seen a 60% rise in the number of households across the UK in uh, temporary accommodation and a shameful 134% rise uh, in rough sleepers since the Conservatives came to power. Indeed, according to official statistics backed by the Chartered Institute of Housing, the number of new government-funded houses built for social rent each year in England has plummeted by 97% since the Tories came to power. And it's set to get worse because the legislation to extend right to buy uh, to housing associations in England will mean another 800,000 socially rented properties in England will, are likely to be sold off, just like the 1.5 million uh, council houses that have already been sold off under right to buy. That was a policy that was imposed on Scotland by the Tories before this parliament was established. And I think it's a great testament uh, in the anniversary of this parliament's foundation that we can look at our legislation to end right to buy, to show that this parliament has made a big, big difference to people's lives and is actually reversing uh, Tory policies. It's just a shame that the previous Labour and Liberal Democrat uh, governments in this parliament didn't have the courage of the SNP to do it earlier. I'm very proud that the SNP government has taken that step. Yes, hello. Elaine Smith. I thank the member for taking the intervention and I do commend the government in, on doing away with the right to buy. But the Lib Lab coalition did actually take steps in the direction of that and I think we should recognise that. John McAlpine. 
Well, it's all very well. I, mean, I thank the member for her intervention, but um, it's all very well talking about taking steps. But uh, perhaps what she's, she's referring to is the previous Labour leader's Mr, Mr. Gray's comments that you passed excellent uh, homelessness legislation, but you just didn't build the houses uh, for people to live in. Uh, I believe the Labour government built six council houses, which is uh, very, very disappointing. I'm very pleased to see that the SNP have absolutely um, topped that by, I think, it's about 5,000 council houses uh, that we've built during our time in office, as well as the affordable 30,000 affordable homes uh, that we've already delivered. Uh, I do want to return to the Tories. Um, I thought that, uh, and, their, um, and their duplicity in terms of their motion, uh, I think Andy Whiteman uh, was a little bit too generous uh, when he praised Ruth Davidson uh, uh, for her uh, sudden conversion to intervention in the market. I, I would just look at their actual record. The most recent piece of housing legislation passed in this parliament was the Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Bill. Uh, that gave more security to the tenants of, uh, of uh, private rented homes, um, all those young people that they, care, they claim to care about. And it gave local authorities the power to apply to ministers for a cap uh, on rent increases in certain areas. The Tories voted against that legislation. Ruth Davidson voted against that legislation. Now, I don't see you making very much noise now. Should Buddy hang your head and excuse me, presiding officer? Yes, I should think so, Ms McAlpin. Could you come to a close, please? Yeah, I will come to a close. Um, the, I don't think the, the, Tories, the Tories do not have any credibility at all when it comes to house building. They're not, they're not, the, party of, uh, they're not the party of housing rights, they're the party of right to buy, and I don't think people in Scotland will be taken in by this PR-driven motion by the Tories today. Thank you. Can I remind all members that I don't like rudeness and uh, I would also ask you to be very careful with your language, please. We are pushed for time. Um, Elaine Smith to be followed by Jenny Gorris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As long as I can remember, I've had a passionate interest in housing, probably because as a child in a working class family, I lived in a privately rented tenement building with an outside toilet and a bed recess in the kitchen. And we moved to a council house in the luxury of a bedroom and a bathroom due to a massive house building programme by the Labour government at that time. And I then did my honours thesis on housing and I was a homelessness officer. In fact, presiding officer, the first falling out I had with my whips was over housing back in 2001. And at that time, I wrote an article for the Scottish Left Review saying, I believe that a home is a fundamental human right, yet in Scotland today, thousands of people are homeless. A walk along the streets of Glasgow or Edinburgh of an evening is a chilling experience if you care to notice the number of souls lying in the shadows with their begging bowls in front of them. These people are the more obvious homeless, many others on seemingly never-ending waiting lists, some of them living in intolerable housing conditions, including overcrowding or sharing with friends or relatives. Well, sadly, not enough has actually changed in the 16 years since I wrote that. Although, I must say, Labour's housing policy is now more in tune with my own views. But, presiding officer, we should commend the Labour-led government's approach to homelessness in 2003 because it has been deemed the most progressive in Europe. Unfortunately, 20 years from the Devolution Act and 10 years from the current government, of the current government, and we still have a huge homelessness problem with rough sleeping on the rise. Shelter Scotland tell us that we are facing a housing crisis due to decades of undersupply in affordable rented housing and homes lost to the right to buy that right-wing housing policy of the Thatcher years. Presiding officer, there is no doubt that in a civilised 21st century Scotland, we need to sort our housing problems out once and for all. A home is a human right, and we should approach this whole debate from that perspective. And I would say not from the perspective of housing wealth as the Tories want. To thousands of people that I know, housing wealth means a secure, warm, publicly rented home, not a property portfolio of ex-council houses. And I'm very pleased that the Labour government, eh, sorry, the, the local government committee, Labour government, <laughs> wishful thinking, the local government committee are undertaking an inquiry into homelessness, which might have helped the government, um, which might have helped encourage the government's uh, welcome commitment in last week's programme to specifically address rough sleeping. There is an opinion of the homeless held by some that it is, um, actually the opinion is not only extremely intolerant, but it's also wrong. And it doesn't recognise that anyone facing unemployment or financial problems could easily face homelessness. 
People become homeless for a variety of reasons, fleeing domestic abuse, breakdown of relationships, job loss, etc. Or maybe they're just one of the over 5,000 kids living in temporary accommodation just now in Scotland. An issue the Local Government Committee is specifically looking at is the Housing First approach, something that Shelter actually first raised in 2008. President Officer, we must strive to place homeless people in safe and secure permanent tenancies from the outset with comprehensive support. However, until we realise that aim, then temporary accommodation must have minimum standards, for example, uh, cooking facilities. We also need to consider the fact that rough sleepers are currently being helped by mainly Christian charitable organisations. And while such help is commendable, the state needs to think again about night shelters, in my opinion. Homeless people shouldn't have to be dependent on charity, church halls, sleeping bags and soup kitchens. Now, there's no doubt that a lack of secure affordable housing causes many problems for people, aside from the obvious ones, including ill health, exacerbating poverty and exclusion from the democratic process. Too many people at present, as we have heard earlier in this debate, are depending on private landlords. And some of those, let's face the reality, are actually the Rachman type that were abolished in the 60s. Unbelievably, the private sector now is actually bigger than the local authority housing sector in Scotland. However, hopefully that is changing. And I applaud um, my own local council, North Lanarkshire, for their programme to build thousands of new council homes ongoing at the moment. President officer, housing is undoubtedly an issue of class politics. And the Tories knew that when they successfully attacked council housing in the 80s and the 90s. They undid the good work done by the post-war Labour government, and they specifically undermined Nye Bevan's vision of the living tapestry of the mixed community, where professionals like doctors and teachers were living beside manual workers with no difference in the type or quality of houses. This, of course, was based on an understanding that housing should be a universal public provision like the NHS. Now, actually, in 1979, more than 20% of those in the top 10% of earners lived in council housing. But as a result of right to buy and the encouragement of owner occupation, by 2005, it was less than 5% of households in the top half of the income distribution who were living in social housing. A continuation of Labour's earlier housing vision would have avoided people scrambling to burden themselves with never-ending mortgages. It would mean that we would not have been dealing with this housing crisis and it would have resulted in a decent affordable home truly being a right of every citizen. And I really doubt that that's the kind of vision the Scottish Tories have for their new towns. The right to buy, stopping councils building houses where right-wing Tory policies that underpinned the housing problem we now have. There is no doubt about that. But more recently, introducing the bedroom tax, removing financial support for housing for under 21s and taking six weeks to give people their first payment of universal credit exacerbates the housing problem. So whilst I don't object to the idea of a national debate, I think Tory members in this chamber really need to recognise that before they can be taken seriously with regard to housing in Scotland, they really need to think about what they have done over the past few decades to housing in Scotland. Presiding officer, at least we're moving on and addressing the housing crisis slowly, you must close, but we must please. urgently address homelessness. Thank you very much. Now, we're really pushed for time, and unless the last three open speakers voluntarily cut half a minute off their speeches, I'm going to have to cut the closing speeches. Jenny Ruth, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, today's motion from the Tory benches calls for a new generation of new towns and garden villages. So, as a constituency member for Glenrothes, it would therefore be remiss for me not to begin today by discussing our old new towns, as it were. Next year marks Glenrothes' 70th birthday. A post-war new town, it was originally planned that Glenrothes would be a garden town, creating a self-contained and balanced community, much like Holyrood then. The Kingdom Centre was, for a time, the largest indoor shopping centre in Scotland. Today, it is owned by Mars Pension Trustees Limited, a private company. They own the civic space of our town. And, presiding officer, much as my charm has been known to lure even the most surprising of suspects, <laughs> Mars Pension Trustees will not speak to me. They put me on to an American real estate company, Jones Lang, uh, Jang, Lang LaSalle, and another individual. Said faceless individual doesn't want to speak to me either, it would transpire. He works in London, a long, long way away from Glenrothes. So whilst I appreciate the government is currently reforming the planning system and that legislation is imminent on this issue, can I ask the Minister to look critically at the ownership of town centres by private companies, including Glenrothes? And I do understand this is also the case in other new towns. Bricks and mortar don't build a community. 
Civic space is important for people to have pride in the place that they come from. It's important for your mental health, for your education, for your health and for your life chances. That's why we need to go back and look at how we support our old new towns, the ones which actually exist today, unlike those in the Tory motion. Cumbernauld, East Kilbride, Irvine, Livingston and Glenrothes. Along with SNP colleagues in this chamber, I am supporting a motion submitted by the Cumbernauld branch to our National Party Conference, which reads, our new towns have also, also have shared challenges and opportunities as a result of their planned nature and time of development. It would be beneficial for those towns and for Scotland to develop a new towns action plan with a clear focus on helping to shape a sustainable future for these towns. Presiding officer, people often talk about Glenrothes and our roundabouts, but what they don't mention are the private landlords, the folk who bought up the cheap council housing owned stock and rent it out now the folk that often don't care about the livelihoods of the people who inhabit their properties. The Private Housing Tenancies Act, as Joe McAlpine previously mentioned, passed last year, is of vital importance in this respect. This legislation protects people from the prospect of unforeseen and unfair eviction and unpredictability over rent increases. And as already been stated by colleagues today, Shelter have argued that it was the Tories' right to buy policy, which has resulted in the loss of more than half a million homes. It was under this SNP government that the Housing Act of Scotland 2014 extended the right to buy for all social housing tenants in Scotland, protecting our existing stock available for social rent and, crucially, stopping the sale of up to 15,500 homes. We also know that when housing stock is sold on to private landlords, safety is not always of paramount concern. But the right to buy didn't only decrease Scotland's housing stock. In written evidence to this Parliament's Local Government Committee, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations stated, where properties within blocks are purchased by owner-occupiers or private landlords, fire doors are often removed the, and replaced with doors that aren't fire-rated. In a post-Grenfell era, this warning carries added significance. Today, Scotland is building social housing at a faster rate than any other part of the UK. Social re uh, rented completions have exceeded the set target of 20,000 and between April 2011 and December 2015, 20,854 houses for social rent were completed. The Scottish Government also offers significantly more grant funding for each unit of affordable housing, with each unit in Scotland supported by an average of £52,400 compared to just £25,300 in England. The Tory motion today, perhaps unsurprisingly, makes no mention of homelessness, and homelessness causes pressures on the housing sector, and every good parliamentarian in this place should consider why. Fife has the third highest largest uh, homeless population in Scotland by council area, with 515 adults and 353 children in temporary accommodation in 2016-17. And just yesterday, the Fife Courier reported that Fife Council is now asking for homelessness agencies to fill the gaps in their service provision. Through housing benefit cuts alone, Fife will lose £3.2 million by 2019-20. The Council attributes this to the Tories' welfare reforms and cuts to housing benefit. Today, the National Audit Office, uh, as has already been stated, reported a 60% increase in homeless families in England. That independent public services watchdog agrees with Fife Council's analysis, stating that Westminster's benefit reforms are likely to have contributed to an increase in homelessness. And from the Scottish Government's research on the total financial cost of the Tories' welfare reforms, North Lanarkshire, Fife and Edinburgh stand to lose £65 million. That's for each council area by 2020-2022. That's a 22% total reduction in welfare spending in Scotland. Ruth's rape clause Tories don't care about community. They're not interested in building bridges. Rather, they have sown the seeds of division through draconian welfare reforms which contravene human rights legislation. Reforms, oh you're awake, reforms which punish Scotland's poorest, marginalise the underrepresented and enable a culture of blame, as long as we don't point the finger of blame at the DUP. So let them pontificate today about garden villages and new new towns, about building community when, as a party, they have actively worked to destroy the social fabric which has bound working class communities in Scotland together for generations. Those of us who actually represent the new towns know everything we need to know about the Tories and their record on housing. Rachel Hamilton, followed by Ruth Maguire. I welcome this debate. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate. It's clear that housing supply in Scotland is not keeping up with the need and the demand generated by demographic change. And it raises an important issue that many in Scotland share, a growing housing crisis, crisis that risks being neglected by an SNP government, government obsessed with looking south to deflect on the concerns we have in the north. Home ownership is a shared aspiration by many, but one that may never materialise. Home ownership has fallen under the SNP. The percentage of housing stock that is owner-occupied has declined from 62.1% in 2006 to 57.9% in 2015. 
In absolute terms, it has fallen from 1.49 million to 1.48 million dwellings. This does not look set to improve when we consider that also under this SNP government, the number of new homes completed has fallen by more than a third. And in 2006, there were 20... Can I finish this point, please? In 2006, there were 25,305 new homes completed, and in 2016, there were 16,498. I'll, I'll give way to Joan McAlpine. Joan McAlpine. I, I thank the member for taking the intervention. Can she explain to us, if she's so keen on new housing developments, why she stood up in this chamber and repeatedly criticised housing developments in East Lothian, including Ghislaine Durleton and Humby, and asked the housing minister why they shouldn't go ahead? Rachel Hamilton. I will not take that point from Joe McAlpine. I think that Joe McAlpine has made some ridiculous accusations today and I will not engage because the SNP are not willing to engage on this very important housing crisis that has been brought on by your government. I think you should get your shovel out. <laughs> presiding, Deputy Presiding Officer, the SNP are on course again to fail housing commitments. Well, you are. The, the 2016 SNP manifesto pledged to build at least 50,000 new affordable homes over this parliament. However, latest stats for 2016 and 17 show only 7,336 such homes were completed. Yeah. If this level continues, there will only be just over 36,000 homes completed by March 2021. The SNP's target will not be achieved until two years later in 2023. The SNP government's Warm Homes Bill is welcome. However, the bill was announced in the last programme for government, but was never presented. And even in its, in its delay, the bill does not go far enough. It should include legislation to include a commitment to upgrading the energy efficiencies of all properties to an EPC rating of C or above by the end of next, next decade to reduce the carbon emissions as well as households' heating bills. It is also a mystery why there is a reluctance to include a commitment to upgrade energy efficiency. As we've heard today, Shelter Scotland have said 940,000 live in fuel poverty, and the proposed bill will set a new statutory fuel poverty target. Why then will the Scottish Government not commit to an energy efficiency target that will help to reduce the cost of heating a home and alleviate fuel poverty? Of course, with any new housing development must come the infrastructure. Building new homes is only step one. The next step is to fill them. Nobody will move to a new town or development that doesn't have the appropriate infrastructure in place to accommodate it. And in this respect, we need to see improved broadband roads and transport links. This is felt particularly in the Scottish borders, an area that has long suffered from these issues. This doesn't entice people to come and live in the borders or indeed for the borders to be recognised as a place that would be worth investing in building new homes. However, I believe that new housing in the borders can work with tandem, in tandem with improvements to broadband, road improvements and integrated public transport network. And there is a strong case to undertake strategic economic transport and housing planning in a coordinated manner. Rural constituencies like mine, with huge opportunity for growth, face a form of geographical inequality because it suffers from these, this infrastructure investment and, put, and that puts off potential investment. Deputy Presiding Officer, the issue is not only that new homes need to be built. The more prevalent issue is the amount of empty homes in Scotland. There are 34,000 empty homes that should be refurbished and brought back to use. The Scottish Borders is not immune from this pro problem. Whilst I was canvassing, I was alarmed at the number of empty homes. They were either vacant or in, or in disrepair. And it is estimated that the Scottish Borders has 1,000 long-term empty homes. Those who wish to refurbish homes or to sell or to rent to help ease the housing crisis should be encouraged. However, numerous constituents have contacted me about their efforts to do just that, making an inhabitable house a home, but now suffer financially from an increased council tax of up to 200% for owning a vacant home. The Conservatives' proposal of help to rebuild would allow councils to implement incentives to owners of empty homes. Presiding officer, this afternoon we have focused on the housing crisis in Scotland. There is a crisis and the SNP need to understand this. There needs fresh thinking, but one that does not have to be looked upon as a singular issue. Instead, we can see housing as an opportunity, an opportunity to alleviate fuel poverty, encourage investment in rural areas and see infrastructure improvements for all. The Scottish borders, for one, would certainly benefit from such an approach. Thank you. 
May I remind all members that they should always speak through the chair and not directly to each other. And I call the last of the open speakers, Ruth Maguire. Sir, um, last week saw the unfortunate spectacle of Tory MSPs boldly trying to claim universal credit was an unmitigated success in one debate and then trying to pin the blame for rising child poverty on this Scottish Government in another, despite sound evidence to the contrary. And this week, they come to the Chamber of our Scottish Parliament with a motion on housing. A motion that completely ignores the staggering damage that's been caused and continues to be caused by the party they represent. A motion that completely fails to recognise the many achievements of this SNP Scottish Government. Let's start with some examples of the damage so conveniently ignored by the Tory motion. We could cite the right to buy policy, which since its introduction in 1980 has seen nearly half a million council and housing association homes sold off with little replacement. A scheme introduced by Thatcher and one still being expanded by the current Tory UK government. We could cite the shameful bedroom tax condemned by the UN as having failed to recognise the specific living arrangements that persons with disabilities require. Or most recently, the axing of housing support for 18 to 21 year olds. Despite warnings from charities and from across the political spectrum that this will force vulnerable young people onto the streets. Presiding officer, they do have some nerve coming to this chamber posing as concerned housing campaigners. The motion refers to the importance of housing for improving health and well-being. I agree, good quality, warm, safe home is of course crucial for health and well-being. But have they really got that little self-awareness? Health and well-being from a party whose policies are described by the UN as a human catastrophe for disabled people. Without an acknowledgement of the harm their policies have done to communities, I just can't take them seriously on this issue. It feels like this new Tory concern for housing, health and well-being is nothing more than an unconvincing PR stunt. As well as ignoring uncomfortable facts about their own party's record, the motion avoids any mention of the positive steps taken by the Scottish Government. An SNP government which has an extremely strong track record when it comes to housing. A government that's building social housing at a faster rate than any other part of the UK, at 64 per 100,000 population, compared to 51 in England, 40 in Wales and 39 in Northern Ireland. A government that since 2007 has built over 40,000 more homes than if we'd matched the lower rate of our neighbours. A government that over the life of this parliament will invest more than 3 billion to deliver 50,000 affordable homes, a 76% increase on our previous five year investment and a massive investment to back up an ambitious tar target. A government that exceeded its previous target of 30,000 affordable homes by more than 10%. And importantly, a government that ended right to buy, a major step in building a sustainable housing policy for the future safeguarding our crucial social housing stock so that is where it is there when people need it most and a government which is spending millions of pounds mitigating the harmful impact of UK Tory welfare cuts on Scottish households money that of course is then unavailable to be invested elsewhere in things like affordable housing the Tories have repeatedly opposed progressive measures to improve conditions for tenants and protect social housing stock since the SNP came into power, the Tories have opposed improved security for tenants. They opposed protection for tenants against high rent increases. They imposed giving local authorities the power to implement rent caps in areas where there are excessive rent charges. Yep. And they opposed the, abol uh, the abolition of right to buy, protecting remaining social housing stock. Based on all this, presiding officer, it's clear to me that the Tories are one of the biggest roadblocks to housing progress and they really, really do have a brass neck coming to this chamber pretending otherwise. So we won't take any lectures from the Tories. The SNP are cleaning up their mess when it comes to housing. Thank you very much for giving us extra time, uh, Ms Maguire. We now move to the closing speeches. Disappointing to note that not all those who were in the debate are in the chamber for the beginning of them. And I call Alex Cole-Hamilton for a strict six minutes, please. A strict six minutes, no problem. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. It's not much, is it? Um, a roof over your head and three square meals a day. It's a social aspiration that's echoed down the centuries in this country. But that first clause in that goal is increasingly hard to come by. 
be that through the slowdown in house building since 2008, the fact that people are living longer and as such, they're not releasing or vacating stock as quickly as they used to, or in the monstrous gap in the socially rented sector in terms of accommodation. These are the, the tenets of this debate. I'd like to thank those who've offered consensus, and I think that's the answer to much of the problems before us. At the top of the debate, Adam Tompkins reminded us of the words of Mark Carney, the, the governor of the Bank of England, who stated that problems in housing represent the biggest risk to the UK economy. Now, it's not just the vagaries in the housing market he's referring to, but the fact that there is a causal link between the health of our housing sector and the health of our nation in terms of... Uh, the, the ability for people to hold down work, to uh, have good physical health and indeed uh, exert, exert less of a demand on the welfare state. Now, Mr Tompkins uh, offered a well-crafted speech, but he was rightly intervened upon by Elaine Smith, who challenged the Tory assertion that the only house worth having is a home that you own. It's something that he did not... Up at one moment, at no moment, did he refer to the socially rented sector in his offering. Then throughout the debate, the Conservative benches have sought to conflate the concept of affordable homes to buy with the socially rented sector. My exchange with Andy Whiteman about the idea of affordability should give the light of that because 75% of half a million is still blindingly out of reach of most first-time buyers. Cabinet Secretary in her speech referenced the need for planning reform and the nascent planning review being undertaken by her colleague Kevin Stewart. And I'd like to take the opportunity to record my thanks to the Minister for the time and access he's offered me and others uh, who hold the housing brief uh, to feed into that review. And I'd like to reiterate my call to him to look at amendments to things like Section 75 orders around planning gain so that we build communities around uh, health services, roads, infrastructure, schools, um, and give planning officers far more teeth than they currently have in addressing the backlog in building control, which is causing a material <coughs> hold-up in terms of building capacity, and in addressing the issue of land banking, which was rightly raised by Monica Lennon. Monica's colleague, Pauline McNeill, rightly pointed out the diminishing proportion of our housing stock given over to socially rented sector. And she was also right, important as she was, to point out the way in which we're given to undercounting the extent of homelessness in this country. And as such, the problem is far bigger than we think. She also took time to evoke the very popular new landmark in my constituency, the Queen's Ferry Crossing. And she's right. When it comes to the legacy of government, this SNP administration will be recognised far longer into history if it can answer the, the rising demands in our housing sector, yeah. the needs for social rent, than for what has been uncharitably referred to as the longest three-span traffic jam in the world. This is an issue which should unite the Chamber. And we saw that somewhat yeah, sure. unlikely love-in from Andy Whiteman in the words and intent of Ruth Davidson in her recent contributions to this national debate. We stand uh, together on these benches with the Green Party on issues like the need to reform local taxation and in discussions around land use, the obligations of developers. And I welcome his contribution. It's clear that as a chamber, we are largely agreed on the nature of the problem, even if we have different ways of solving it. But it's clear also that given the stock we need, it is a question of material capacity we need to address. But that problem is going to be exacerbated by two problems in particular, both addressed in the amendment in my name. Firstly, in the impact of a hard Brexit. Now, there isn't a soul in this chamber who doesn't understand the importance of our European migrant workforce to the construction industry. For decades, they have contributed skills, experience and innovation in the building of Scotland's homes. Now, Brexit is fundamentally undermining the security of their status here, and they are leaving. This is an existential threat to our country's capacity to build homes, and it's a challenge that we can't expect to answer with apprentices coming out of Scotland's colleges. And why? Because they simply don't exist. The quiet erosion of the FE sector has led to a fundamental skills gap. Uh, we must also take steps to close, and through the reversal of our cuts to Scotland's colleges and college places. So I submit the Liberal uh, Democrat amendment to the will of this chamber. There is much about the contributions that we have heard this afternoon in this debate around which we should coalesce and can build consensus, not least about the fact that having a stable home is not just the foundation, but is the prerequisite to social mobility. 
As Sol Horuk, the American impresario, said, the sky is the limit when you have a roof over your head. And as such, presiding officer, I once again move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much again for brevity. And I call Andy Whiteman. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. Um, it's been a good uh, debate this afternoon, I think. One year exactly on from the last very short government debate we had on the 13th of September last year. And I hope it's not... Uh, we, we won't ha just have these debates on an annual basis because I think many of the points that members have raised are far too important for that. And despite the uh, understandable political uh, ding-dongs and critiques, um, which I am happy to engage in at uh, any time, but perhaps not in very valuable chamber time when we're looking for solutions, I think there is a lot of agreement. As I indicated at the outset, we want radical change, and we are convinced that that's possible within the powers of this Parliament. And I'm also encouraged from what members have said that I think some of that radical change could, with the political will, command a majority uh, in this chamber. And some of what divides us, I think, may be uh, assumptions about how we should go forward, and certainly uh, perhaps priorities uh, as well, priorities uh, for housing. Uh, James Dorman ex uh, explained that the, financial, the failure of the 2007 target set by uh, Nicola Sturgeon was due to the financial crash. Uh, Monica Lennon indicated that she, in her professional capacity, had been a victim uh, of that. But the aftermath of that crash was a consequence of the financialization of housing. It wasn't a response to any fundamental failure in our ability to actually acquire land and build houses. It was entirely due to the financialization of housing. And we have the powers to ensure that the consequences are overcome principally by tackling the key component of that financialization, which is the land question. And so in particular, let me reiterate and recognize that the speculative volume house building industry is itself, due to its financial model, part of the problem. And our priority should be to eliminate that industry within a decade. Now, I regret that that analysis is not more widely shared, but I'm happy to speak to members about some of the assumptions underpinning it. It was well illustrated, in fact, by George Osborne, who I seem to remember was a chancellor some years ago when he went to Dublin in 2006 and gave a speech in Trinity College where he claimed that Ireland stands as a shining example of the art of the possible in long-term economic policymaking. Well, soon after, of course, the Irish economy crashed and burned on the back of 420 billion, pound, billion euros of debt secured on a mountain of land and property speculation. So as I said at the outset, I agree with Ruth Davidson. We should be looking to countries like Germany and like the Netherlands, countries where, as she correctly said, 60 or 70% of housing is self-built, it is self-procured, customers are in control, the SME sector is much more powerful. Competition by house builders is not for land, it's, for, uh, it's between companies who want to build you the best possible house that's as energy efficient as possible and will last as long as possible. Those are not the competitive pressures currently uh, in place in the volume house building industry. In addition, municipalities in countries like Germany and the Netherlands can have, and they have the legal power, and they've had it since reconstruction after the Second World War, and we had those same powers as well before they were abolished in the 50s. They have the power to acquire land at existing use value, well, well below, to a factor of, 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 of 20 or 100 or so, uh, the cost of land with planning permission to service those plots, to master plan them, and to sell them on. And as a consequence, they have higher quality homes with lower costs of energy that last far, far longer than the design life of most new build property in the United Kingdom. And I was re reading recently, for example, of something that's entirely normal in the German experience. A group of women in their 50s, whose families had left home, who got together and built a new tenement block in the heart of Berlin. That is entirely unexceptional. That kind of project is undertaken with the assistance of the local council and within an ecosystem of highly professional, technically skilled and innovative builders and designers. Now, Labour's Elaine Smith rightly pointed out that housing is a human right. We agree. And Pauline McNeill said that it should be part of the national infrastructure priorities. We agree with that. 
And one point I have frequently made in relation to care and repair of properties and refurbishment and energy efficiency is that in places like Edinburgh, the tenements, in fact, are not, strictly speaking, private property. They may be that in law, but they are actually, in fact, part of the public infrastructure of the city. They've been there for longer than some of the streets and some of the other public infrastructure. The private interest occurs as a consequence of the fact that people occupy them for short, temporary periods of time. And yet it's incredibly difficult still to get the appropriate maintenance and upgrade that we need to common property. Alex Cole Hamilton mentions affordability, and we think this is a priority for government to redefine what's meant by affordability. Just yesterday, the UK government's house price index showed a 4.8% increase in house prices in Scotland, the only part of the UK where house price inflation is growing, and in the private rented sector, a two-bedroom flat in Edinburgh, £950 a month. 6% increase in last year, 32% increase in the last five years. We also agree with Maurice Gold that the Warm Homes Bill provides an incredible opportunity and we welcome discussions around mandatory um, interventions in the private uh, owned market to upgrade properties at the point of, of sale. Miles Briggs made some good points about health. Jenny Golruth uh, regaled us with the wonders of the new towns, much of which uh, I agree with. I don't have time to tell the story about uh, my favourite author, uh, Ian McHarg and his bid to develop Scotland's third new town. Greens have exciting ideas. You must and in the close. forthcoming planning bill, we want to implement some of them. I want to thank all members for their contributions, commend our motion, and look forward to further discussions. Mark Griffin, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Firstly, I'd like to draw members' attention to my register of interests. I always welcome the opportunity to speak about housing in the Chamber. I think that housing, homelessness, house building, availability and housing support are massive issues facing people in Scotland. And like Adam Tompkins, I don't feel that that gets the coverage that it fully deserves. Monica Lennon said in her speech that housing is essential to people's physical well-being, mental health, education and to a strong economy. And I, like others, um, have said that solving Scotland's housing crisis must be higher up the political agenda. Affordable housing is a platform for those on low incomes to build their lives as a potential stepping stone out of poverty. Under the SNP and the Tories, housing costs have pushed more people into poverty. Rent arrears are increasing as a result of benefit changes and social sector evictions are on the rise. I think it's frankly absurd for Ruth Davison to suggest the Tories have the answers to the housing crisis when her party is doing so much to make it impossible for people to afford a warm, safe home. Housing is a key pillar of the welfare state, but it seems that that has been forgotten. Only Labour has the right to a warm, safe home for everyone at the centre of our philosophy. In our 2016 manifesto, we committed to building 60,000 affordable homes over the parliamentary period, three quarters of which would be available for rent. And we can be in no doubt that there is a housing crisis in Scotland. There are so many individual statistics and indicators of that. Scottish householders renting privately at almost three times the level it was in 1999. Social housing tenants renting from a local authority or housing association down a third over the same period. Last year, housing costs pushed 170,000 more people into poverty. And that growth of the private rented sector, coupled with private sector rents rising faster than inflation, means a growing housing benefit bill for the government and more of it going to private landlords. In 2015, almost half a billion pounds of government money was spent on the private rented sector through housing benefit. How much good would that half billion pounds, well, how much good would that have done to build new energy efficient, safe homes? And evictions are increasing in local authorities and housing associations. People are finding it harder and harder to buy their own home and a third of all households in Scotland are living in fuel poverty. You know, we can go on and on, talk about different statistics, uh, different indicators, but it should be clear to everyone that there is a housing crisis 
in Scotland, but that doesn't seem to have been acknowledged. I might be wrong, but I don't think a single government speaker um, addressed or acknowledged that we have a housing crisis mm -hmm. in Scotland. But we've been clear and we've set out a range of policies to start addressing that situation. We need more uh, truly affordable homes, and that means building more. The government are committed to building 50,000 affordable homes, including 35,000 for social rent by, uh, by the end of this parliament, but we believe we need more. Shelter Scotland's recommendation was for 60,000 new homes, and we agree. We also need guarantees that the government is on track with its home building. When questioned, the government points to statistics that give no guarantees of that end target being hit and demonstrate no national strategy. Social sector evictions have increased in areas where universal credit is being rolled out, driven in particular by that six-week waiting period for the first payment. In full service areas of universal credit, citizen advice have reported a 15% rise in rent arrears compared to a national increase of 2%, an 87% increase in crisis grants compared to a national average of just nine. They also published research earlier this year in that found that 22% of the public have no savings to fall back on, while a further 24% had less than two months' income. Shelter Scotland warned that the cuts to housing benefit and the rollout of universal credit could have a considerable impact on rent arrears and evictions. The rollout of universal credit should be halted and the six-week waiting time should be scrapped. Rent rises in the private sector have increased faster than the rate of inflation and we welcome the Scottish Government's reversal of their opposition to rent controls. We are also calling for the Government to ensure that all private sector properties reach an energy performance certificate rating of at least C by 2025. Although this has been recommended by the Government's own Strategic Working Group on Fuel Poverty, they have chosen to disregard it and set a minimum standard of EPC level D. And that lack of ambition comes after the Government missed the eradication of fuel poverty target set by Labour and 33% of homes in the private sector are in fuel poverty. President officer, the scale of the challenges in the housing sector are clear. We are calling on the Tory government to reverse their crippling welfare reforms, which are making things worse, and for the Scottish government to step up their response to the same scale as the challenges the sector faces. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am aware that the sound has gone a bit strange. Uh, we are investigating it at the moment. Meanwhile, I call Kevin Stewart to echo through the chamber for up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Be a joy from it for everyone with the voice that I've got, presiding officer. I probably don't need the microphone, but there we go. Um, I certainly welcome the opportunity to close the debate for the government. Uh, we, as a government, want to maintain a, a range of housing options to suit not just a range of individual circumstances, but also how those circumstances change over time. Where we live can shape us and can shape our life chances. And we've already heard from a number of speakers today uh, about their experiences as, as children. Uh, and we got our first council house when I was four. Uh, and I know how grateful uh, we were uh, for that. From the homes that we grew up in as children to entering an adulthood of student accommodation, social or private rents, first owned homes, uh, and on to the homes where we may want to retire and which will suit our differing circumstances and maybe, of course, also our changing health or mobility needs. That is why we as a government are absolutely committed to delivering affordable housing across this country. Uh, we recognise the intrinsic links between building housing and inclusive growth providing warm and affordable homes and tackling inequalities and poverty. And in 2009, we introduced, reintroduced council house building, building over 8,500 council homes since then. And I want there to be many, many more of those council homes across Scotland. And it was, of course, as many speakers have pointed out, this government that ended the right to buy 
protecting the existing stock of social rented homes and the sale of up to 15,500 other houses. And in the last parliamentary session, we delivered over 33,000 homes for affordable rent, 10% above the target, and 22,523 of those were for social rent, 20% above the target. And our rate of house building completions across all sectors puts Scotland ahead of England and Wales. Uh, and that is borne out uh, by the statistics that were published only yesterday. House building across all sectors was 19% higher here than it was in England and two thirds higher than it was in Wales. And beyond that, yesterday's figures show that affordable housing supply approvals in the year to end June 2017 were up 30% on the previous year to 10,612 homes. A level of activity in the affordable house building sector not seen since the early 1980s, with almost 12,000 homes approved since the start of the target period. Much already achieved, much more still to be done. But that is why we have invested over three billion pounds over the course of this parliament to deliver that target of 50,000 affordable homes. A 76% increase on our previous five year investment. And beyond that, we have given stability and guarantees to local authorities that have not existed for a very long time, with three-year resource planning assumptions amounting to £1.75 billion of investment. And beyond social housing, we have also ensured that funding has been maintained for rural uh, housing funds and um, at the instigation of uh, some of our Liberal Democrat colleagues, we added an islands housing fund uh, to that mix too. Uh, and we will continue to listen uh, to folk around about uh, all of these issues. Uh, open market shared equity has helped other folk into home ownership. And uh, Pauline McNeill asked me a specific question around about help to buy schemes. Uh, and we've made £195 million available over the three years till March 2019. Uh, and this scheme uh, will be carefully monitored and we'll consider its future in 2018. And I'm willing to speak to Polly McNeill and other colleagues uh, around about that. Beyond that, in general terms, we are bringing uh, together, after uh, an independent review, a planning bill, uh, which should simplify our planning system uh, and hopefully uh, will lead uh, to uh, greater growth in terms of housing. But one of the things which frustrates me as housing minister and planning minister is, at the one hand, I am told we must have more houses. And often, the same person will respond in the next sentence by saying, we didn't want them built there. And that is one of the reasons why I want community planning and spatial planning to become intertwined, which was something that Monica Lennon mentioned in her speech. Presiding officer, um, there is much work to be done in this area. Um, we have no uh, monopoly of knowledge. I will continue um, to speak to colleagues from right across the chamber. But one thing which I will not do is that I will not take any lectures on housing from the Conservatives, the party that sold off council housing willy-nilly in this country. The party that wants to repeat that mistake by selling housing association homes in England under a new right to buy there. We will not make those mistakes here and we will take no lessons from the Conservatives on that front. And Mr Griffin, in his speech, was right to point out the dangers of Tory welfare reform and its impact on housing and people here in Scotland. The Tories are the party that provides no financial support for under-21s and instead introduced the benefit cap 
and frees that are seeing families right across the UK, not just here in Scotland, but right across the UK at risk of homelessness. That is something that we will never consider. And I believe that all of those powers should rest here so that we can make those decisions. The Tories are also the party that voted against the Scottish Government Tenancies Bill um, that is introducing stability and predictability for tenants. And instead, they brought in the bedroom tax, which affects over 70,000 homes in Scotland and which Scottish Government mitigates to keep people safer in their homes. Just Close, think please, if we Minister. had that money from bedroom tax mitigation to put into even more housing for the people of Scotland. Presiding officer, please. the government is committed to everyone in Scotland living in an affordable quality home that meets their needs. Not just the wealthy and not just those who can afford Close, to buy a home, please, but everyone across Scotland. Thank you. I call Graeme Simpson to close this debate. Nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's been a useful and important debate. There's been considered contributions from most sides, um, bar the SNP. Yeah. Housing, um, housing um, Presiding Officer, is uh, too often the poor relation of political debate. It's overlooked, it doesn't get the press very excited, and frankly, it doesn't get a lot of politicians excited, though they'll try to tell you otherwise. The fact we've only had one cabinet minister here today uh, perhaps tells its own story. Um, and I thought her contribution was something of a shambolic rant in uh, contrast, apart from the end section, uh, to her colleague, Mr. Stewart's. Housing is just not seen as sexy. I think it is, presiding officer. Nothing, nothing is more important than having a roof over your head. A warm, well-insulated property in good condition, security of tenure if you rent, the right to back up if you need it, as Pauline McNeill said so eloquently. Now, we've heard some right old nonsense today, presiding officer, from other parties, mainly the SNP, saying that housing is not an issue that Conservatives should be talking about. Maybe they're embarrassed. Maybe they're embarrassed by their own records. They certainly should be, that we have sink estates in our great cities, no-go areas, people sleeping rough, should be a source of shame for the SNP and Labour. They have counted... Order, please. Order, please. No. No. <laughs> you, you have counted... You've counted on the votes of people living in the poorest areas of this country for decades and taken them for granted. Now, expert after expert says we have a housing crisis. Crisis, the homelessness charity, was formed 50 years ago by a Conservative, Ian MacLeod. It should not exist today, nor should Shelter, whose plea for a national, a national homeless strategy was snubbed for so long by the SNP. And I'm certainly not convinced that the measures announced by the programme for government amount to such a thing. Perhaps Kevin Stewart, perhaps Kevin Stewart will tell us differently next week. Homelessness is the end result of a failed system or a lack of a system. It's not some academic concept to be discussed in worthy research papers. It involves real people. Real people leading the most chaotic of lives. So when we put housing at the forefront of our policy agenda, it's these people, it's these people, Miss Martin, that we're thinking of, and we're proud of that. I'll take your intervention. Julian Martin. Thank you. Thank you. It's actually, it's actually a question. I mean, you, you're, the Tory party are wanting to build 100,000 new homes. Can you tell me how many of them you would like to actually make social housing yeah. the for, that would affect the people that you're just talking about? Graeme Simpson. I'll come on to those new homes, but we're talking about homes across all tenures. We do need new homes. We do need new homes. As Adam Tompkins said. Now, in 2015, Nicola Sturgeon said, 
Making sure that everyone has a safe, warm and affordable home is central to our government's drive to make this country fairer and more prosperous, and I couldn't agree more. But housing output in Scotland is flatlining. Just over 16,000 homes were built last year. A whopping, Mr Stewart, 88 more than the year before. And the number of homes being started in the same period fell by 2%. The number of homes being built is more than a third down on 2007 levels. That means prices and rents are still too high for many people and our youngsters struggle to get their foot on the housing ladder. We need to do more across all tenures and for that we need, again, as Adam Tonkin said, imaginative policies of the kind lacking from this government. Now Ruth Davidson has called for a new generation of new towns to be built. I live in Scotland's first new town, East Kilbride. It's 70 years old. It's time for a new wave of settlements designed for active travel, designed to use less energy, designed for the people, with the people. To do that, we say there should be a new National Housing and Infrastructure Agency and a Cabinet Minister covering the same. That might benefit you, Mr Stewart. <laughs> Not to override councils, but to lead from the front. Too often things don't get built because of wrangles over who's going to pay for what. So we say we need an infrastructure first approach. And Ruth Davidson has highlighted one way of achieving that. Land value capture. Again, presiding officer, doesn't sound very sexy. It's really sexy. Using this system... Using Order, this please. system... Well, I'm, 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 I'm glad the Chamber agrees with me. <laughs> Using this system could unlock £8.6 billion of additional funds in the Edinburgh City region alone over the next 20 years, according to the Centre for Progressive Capitalism, and at no cost to the public purse. It could be one feature of a dynamic reformed planning system, and using this system or other methods, the new agency would pinpoint and evaluate new development sites, bring brownfield land forward for development and install any necessary infrastructure. Agency acquired land could be sold specifically to smaller builders, private rented sector investors, or for self-build and co-ownership. And Scotland lags behind other countries in all those fields. This widening of participation will assist a vibrant SME sector and support the wider economy. But, as Maurice Golden, Miles Briggs and Andy Whiteman have said in this debate, we also need to ensure that existing homes are fit for purpose. The Scottish Housing Condition Survey, published in December, paints a harrowing picture of the current condition of Scotland's housing stock. Pa particularly, Mr. certainly. Um, Kevin Stewart. Mr. President Officer, I asked Mr Simpson's colleague earlier if he would support our calls uh, to get the UK Government to eradicate VAT from housing repairs, which would help in a, a great degree in this regard. Will he support our call for that eradication of VAT for housing repairs? Graham Simpson. Given the um, state of the housing stock, uh, particularly the stock built pre-19, a quarter of uh, Scottish dwellings are, are, are in our tenements. Um, given the conditions, and some of them are in critical dis disrepair, some critical, urgent and uh, extensive disrepair, I think all options need to be looked at. We do need, we do need a strategy uh, to deal with uh, the condition of tenements. Now, a significant proportion of more recently developed housing is also reaching a similar stage of requiring major repairs. We've got two opportunities to change things, presiding officer, through the planning bill and the warm homes bill. The planning system is reactive, it's developer-led. We actually need a system that plans for what we need. It's also true that planning is done to communities and not by communities. So we need to factor in the best standards of design and energy efficiency. We can already build homes that require no central heating, none. I've seen some near Lockerbie, built in a, a factory at Cambers Lang by CCG. We should have more homes like this built off-site. 
The Warm Homes Bill should provide a clear statutory foundation for a new fuel poverty strategy, including the new target date for the eradication of fuel poverty, which affects a third of households in Scotland. Presiding officer, we've got huge challenges ahead and settling for more of the same is no longer enough. Big challenges require big thinking. We on these benches are up for that. We're proving it, but the Scottish Government is being found wanting. I support the motion in Adam Tonkin's name. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on housing. The next item of business is consideration of two business motions, motion 7647 setting out a business programme and motion 7648 on the stage one timetable of a bill. Uh, I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motions to say so now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move both the motions on behalf of the bill. Move together. Thank you very much. And no member is asked to speak against the motions. The question is therefore that motions 7647 and 7648 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion 7655 on substitution on committees. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 7655. Moved. Thank you very much. And now we come to decision time. And there are six questions today. I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Angela Constance is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton would fall. So the first question is that amendment 7613.2 in the name of Angela Constance, which seeks to amend motion 7613 in the name of Adam Tompkins, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to our division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 7613.2 in the name of Angela Constance is yes, 61, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I remind members that if the, name, if the amendment in the name of Pauline McNeill is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Andy Whiteman and Alex Cole Hamilton would fall. The question is that Amendment 7613.4 in the name of Pauline McNeill, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Adam Tompkins, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. <laughs> We're not agreed. We'll move to a division again, and members may cast their votes now. The result, of the, the result of the vote on Amendment 7613.4 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes, 26, no, 97. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I remind members if the amendment in the name of Andy Whiteman is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton would fall. The question is that Amendment 7613.3 in the name of Andy Whiteman, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Adam Tompkins, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members be cast those votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 7613.3 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, six, no, 98. There were 19 abstentions. 
The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 7613.1 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Adam Tompkins, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may, members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 7613.1 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes, 10, no, 92. There were 20 abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question is that motion 7613 in the name of Adam Tompkins is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 7613 in the name of Adam Tompkins is yes, 31, no, 92. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that motion 7655 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on substitution on committees be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Bruce Crawford on Stirling University's anniversary. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.